You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Do you like movies? Do you like TV? Do you like discussing the temporal effects of non-linear time travel and its implication on the plot of the movie Looper? Uh, okay. Do you enjoy the latest in pop culture news? Do you enjoy superheroes? Do you enjoy discussing the relative merits of superpowers and their effects on human physiology? Anyways, if you enjoy these things, even a small amount, you'll love the Rusted Robot Podcast. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, YouTube, and make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Subscribe so you never miss an episode. The Rusted Robot.Podbean.com Hello, and welcome again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast. I am your host, The Monster, back to give you another podcast of sci-fi news, plus. What's that plus? I'll get to that in a moment. So, as always, I will be talking my big three sci-fi news items for this week. We have mon from Supergirl. Getting his costume back, or costume for the first time. We're also going to be talking about... Are we? Are we really? Are we really going to get Mara Jade? Question mark. So we'll see about that. And the last sci-fi big news. Are we really going to get a Black Widow movie? Finally? So... The plus part to the sci-fi news that I'll be talking about, I got lucky with getting a guest on my show. So normally, it's just me or my co-host, Mr. Gene, and I talking, and on rare occasions, we get Tony to do Star Trek stuff. But I met Jeff a couple of years back at a geek nerd out event up in Boca Raton, and kept in contact over the years and just happened to hook up this past week to talk about some Black Panther and Black sci-fi talk. So that'll be at the very end. And to let you know, that's just that conversation alone is over an hour. So my normal talking time of the sci-fi news stuff is going to be about 20 minutes. So it's going to be a very long podcast. So I'll try to keep it short and sweet and to the point. But let's get started. But wait just a damn minute. The latest news I heard before I even get started with the sci fi stuff Paramount is looking to possibly produce two Star Trek movies. So remember, we have the J.J. Abrams stuff in which he was talking about Chris Pine, Chris, Chris Helmsworth coming back to do some kind of weird time travel story, who knows. The other side of that is that the second movie, Quentin Tarantino was interested in doing his version of Star Trek as a rated R movie. So, are we getting two different films then? I don't know. And I don't know when they'll come out. But, uh, CinemaCon was an event this past week that Paramount made this news happen. So it's still vague as far as what they're talking about or how this is all going to come out. But the other news, and this came out actually early this morning, today being Friday the 27th, which I saw on my feed, is that there is a female director for the new Star Trek movie. And this is the one that J.J. Abrams is planning to do. So, he's kind of out of the picture as far as directing, which is a plus, because he's got Star Wars to worry about. You know, just go do that. Bye. And I'm kind of excited about this, because one, we haven't had this... this kind of fundamental change to the norm of male directors. Justin Lin is Asian, uh, and the last Star Trek movie was uh, Star Trek Beyond. So, you know, with the success of Wonder Woman, 
and having Patty Jenkins direct a, a great um, superhero movie, it's giving us a lot more options for new voices, new perspectives to come into play. And we really do need that for Star Trek. Of all things, to be more inclusive, you really need to have that for Star Trek. So, uh, the director they tap for Star Trek 4, her name is S.J. Clarkson. So, as soon as I get more information about what's going on with the new Star Trek movies, and the timeline, and all that fun stuff, I will let you know. So, the other note. Since today is Friday, April 27th. Oh, I forgot to mention, yesterday was April 26th. Why is April 26th more important than the 27th? Not really, but sort of. It was Happen Alien Day, 426. So, if you understand the reference, LV426 is the planet that aliens, or alien, took place on. Hence why it was Happen Alien Day of all days. But today being the 27th. Finally, it is here. Ten years in the making. We get Thanos. <laughs> we get the Infinity Gauntlet. We get the Infinity War movie, finally. So, I made a post on my Facebook page. I am not going to be talking about this movie even after I watched it, which is going to be this Sunday, like the first showing. Um, so, um, we'll be talk doing a podcast about this, but I am not doing any kind of spoilers, not even, oh, I, I loved it, and not give anything. No, I'm not doing any of that. But, if you are so inclined, if you've seen this movie, I would love to know your feedback. So email me at monstersci-fi-show at gmail.com and I promise I will read your comments, your reviews, your insight, whatever you want to talk about for Avengers Infinity War and I will put that into the next podcast for that. All right, so no spoilers. I will find you. So let's get started finally. All right. As you know, Supergirl was off the air for a bit and replaced by Legends of Tomorrow, which is now done with its season. That that whole Supergirl move in itself was just ridiculous. I would have loved to have Supergirl stay where she was on Monday, but nonetheless, Supergirl's back. So this past week, this past Monday, literally, we finally get Monel in his Monel superhero outfit. Which, by all appearances, looks fantastic. It's kind of like the opposite color scheme of what Superman would wear. Instead of the red cape, his is blue. Instead of a blue uh, unitard, uh, it's red. And of course, instead of red boots, they're blue. So basically, it's kind of, again, the opposite color scheme of that. Now, having said that and watch the episode and you know it, it, it does the job for the small scale on TV it does it fine I'm kind of not irked but it's kind of like okay if you remember the Incredibles and Edna Mall talked about no capes well Monel is kind of using his cape as a weapon, so to speak, and I'm like, well, you're not really, like, spawn and using the cape really fully well, but he is mixing it up in his fighting style to have the cape be part of his onslaught or defensive mechanism, whatever that it may be. So he's kind of flinging it about, and it's kind of awkward to watch. Because he's also training Supergirl to do the exact same thing. So, as much as I really enjoy watching Supergirl, and again, I love the costume. I'm not knocking it. But I'm just thinking, we've waited almost two seasons to see the costume. And his powers are starting to come into play. He's able to fly now. 
he's able to you know really do stuff but I can do without the cape thing because he's not a matador you know and that's what it kind of looks like I'm like he's fighting an imaginary bull but uh, uh, alright so I'll just leave it at that alright the other piece of news is that we have uh, something came out during the week in which there was some kind of casting news or some kind of posting about some character named Mara. Okay. Well, if this is the Mara that we all want, if you know Mara Jade, she was working with Palpatine back when he was alive, went to fight against Luke, wound up ultimately marrying, and they had children, right? Wrong. Because the extended universe of Star Wars doesn't exist because Disney said so. But now there's this casting call for a a, a female lead between the ages of 40 and 50. So, what could that mean? I don't know. But, if we remember in The Force Awakens, the last shot, as the camera pulls back, Luke is standing next to some kind of headstone-y thing. Maybe that could have been Mara or someone that he loved and cared for buried there. But, of course, Last Jedi, none of that mattered because nothing was even acknowledged or, or even like, hey, what about The Rock? No one has ever talked about that. It gets complicated with the whole Star Wars universe because of this whole Ryan did this to JJ's work and now JJ's coming back and he has to undo what Ryan did. And But if we're going to get Mara, and hopefully it is Mara Jade, it would be nice to have another female presence on the screen. We'll see what happens. You know, it would be amazing if they kind of undo the whole your parents were nothing that Kylo said to Rey and Mara turns out to be the mother to Rey that would be really really cool but again the extended universe does not exist per se in the sense that the only character really can, that kind of survived, but it's in the past, so it, it really, you can argue it's still there, is Thrawn. Thrawn appeared on Rebels in the animated series, which we're going to get another series called Resistance. So that one, I think, is more close to the First Order, like the first, um, uh, the Force Awakens timeline. So I'm, I have to do some more research on that. But... Thrawn, if you know, took place after Return of the Jedi, and Timothy Zahn did three books for that. So, a very interesting character, most most liked, I think, second to Mara Jade uh, in my book, as far as really kind of shaking up that whole Star Wars universe of having, having a really cool character. But Mara Jade is a, is a fan's ultimate wish to have and I hope if you're going to win back fans considering how much this whole Star Wars universe this last two movies kind of has really pissed off a lot of Star Wars fans you could at least throw us a bone even if it's just Amara Jane it would go so far to bind the galaxy together better than the force could <laughs> so we'll see about that well oh, it would be great if it was Mara Jane the the last point is that we're going to be finally it's close to almost getting there uh, a Black Widow movie so we've had 18 Marvel Cinematic, Cinematic Universe movies that Black Widow plays a big part in and considering that she is a non-powered person she is still an interesting character and 
you remember the first, I think, the Avengers movie, how Loki talked about how she has a lot of red on her ledger. So, the storyline in this case is about what happens in Budapest and the meeting between Hawkeye and her. And that's going to be, uh, I think, possibly playing in the time frame either before uh, Iron Man, which came out in 2008, or between Iron Man and Iron Man 2. I'm not sure when with the timeline, but we'll see about that, basically, uh, working into a, a storyline. Now, the other thing, too, is that because this took place in Russia, or at least they're about, to, they're looking at possibly maybe getting Sebastian Stan, the Winter Soldier, to be part of this, since she does know of him. She could be on a mission, or she could be, you know, in the mix there to know that he is out there. So, that will be really, really damn cool to see this on big screen, because she really deserves some time on the big screen. Red Sparrow was our hope for a Black Widow movie. Kind of panned out. So, let's hope for a Black Widow movie as a Black Widow movie and just go from there. So, um, I don't know anything more for the time frame. So, considering what's going to be happening in the next couple of years, I don't see, unfortunately, Black Widow coming out until sometime well after 2020. Because, again, we still have Avengers 4 coming out, which will end Phase 3. And then if by that time, the X-Men and Sony... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, the, if we get the X-Men and Fantastic Four coming over, that will open up Phase 4, and hopefully she will not get pushed aside. But we'll see what happens by that time frame. Alright, so that's going to be the end of my sci-fi news portion, so let me start playing my conversation with Jeff Carroll. I was watching 007. Uh, which one? Um, Spectre. Oh, Spectre. Black Panther's father. Yeah, not one of my favorites. I I liked um, Skyfall so much more. Do you, do you like which one? Skyfall, the one before uh, yeah. this. I like. I mean, I like Skyfall. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not opposed to to any of this. Last one, Spectre, was kind of the weakest one. Yeah, I mean, considering you know? um, how it was like kind of a reboot. Okay. With Daniel in the beginning, it was kind of like. All right, so he doesn't say the you know okay. famous phrase you know my name is Bond James Bond it come ha- happens at the end of the movie. You like him saying? He's like him saying my name is James Bond. Yeah. So it's in- it's interesting that we're doing this one more time with him, but I'm like I- I'm kind of done with Daniel. Let's get someone else in. <laughs> well, the mix. see to me, he's he's fifty times better than Pierce Brosnan. Really. Yes, that was corny. I mean, I know Pierce Brosnan has the arrogance, yeah. you know, that James Bond usually has, but I'm not a big fan of the arrogance either. I liked, um, uh, you know, my favorite James Bond was, um, oh God, what's his name? Ro- uh, Roger um, Moore? Roger, I like Roger Moore and the other one. Sean the one Connor. That was in the movie? Sean Connery. Yeah, the yes, original. Roger Moore and Sean Connery. And Sean Connery, had a smile that he brought to his smartness that he didn't really come off as arrogant as he his character would lead you to believe mm. and and um he, so he was cool you know I, mean? I, I, I had no problem with him that's cool I mean I'm always interested you know, um, I'm always interested to see what people think about you know what's their favorite James Bond uh, actor, so to speak, um, and it really kind of right. depends on when they saw their first James Bond movie. So, like for me, it, it was like Roger Moore was like kind of my James Bond, but I've grown to appreciate everything that Sean Connery brought to the role. I, I I'm, I'm older than the, the Moore. I saw Sir Majesty's Secret Service, and mm-hmm. I like uh, him as well. Um, 
So I'm, I like them. I like those. You know, all of them was yeah. good. Even the other one that was in between Roger Moore, Sean Connery. Oh, yeah, Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton. Yeah, Timothy yeah. was not bad. I didn't have a problem with him. You know, um, I don't know what it was I didn't like about Pierce. Because Pierce did two or three. I think he... He did GoldenEye, World Is Not Enough, uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, yeah, those was all... I didn't like any of them. I think it suffered from special effects of the time, uh, where it was, you know, over-the-top special effects. You know, uh -huh. I know James Bond always has stuff, but it's more believable, especially now with Daniel Craig. He's doing a lot of stunts, but they're just more realistic in terms of the things they do. I mean, Sean Connery was driving speedboats and jumping and over bridges and stuff like that, yeah. which I understood. But Pierce Brosnan was driving a tank down the main street. <laughs> <laughs> and I just felt that, you know, that was um, destruction um, gore. You yeah. know what I'm saying? No, I get or it. Or destruction porn, what yeah. do you call it, whatever it is. And so... I, 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 it lost me a little bit on that. Okay. Oh, I get it. So I'm not sure if you Here's follow Supergirl from, or if you follow... I like it, but okay. I don't have time to keep up with it. Um, is she going to, she's going to be brought into the Justice League or uh, which movie? No, none. This is just... I thought she was being brought into something. Uh, they have the Legion of the Superheroes, which is... Saturn Girl and Brainiac Five, so Monel, which is technically part of the Legion of Superheroes in the comics, um, is like the year three thousand or something like that. So they travel. Um, in this case, in the Supergirl TV series, um, Monel already had a romance with uh, Supergirl, but because of how things ended in season two. He had to go off world because of the lead that was being laced around the world, and that is hazardous to him. Um, and then somehow he got teleported into the future. And in this season, he came back already married uh, to Saturn Girl, and now we get to see his costume for the first time. So, I'm not oh, okay. And, and who is he? How does he have powers? Is he from Krypton, too? Um, it's uh, a cousin world of Krypton. I forgot the name of the planet. So he's kind of like so he, sort of related to Superman, but not necessarily like like a cousin. It's like, you know, it's a long, complicated story. But basically, it's one of those. He kind of almost has the same kind of powers as Superman, but in this case... We haven't seen much of anything. He hasn't done any flying or uh, taking bullets or anything like that. So he's still getting acclimated to his powers. So it's a little different from yeah. the comics. Now, so, do you know if Krypton is going to show Supergirl parents and family? They're so focused on Superman's origin and Krypton and Kryptonite and yeah. all of that. Um, are they going to show where she comes from? Because to me, Supergirl and all of her world are just like rewritten, I mean, afterthoughts to to the Superman creation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think, you know, because it was like Superman was the last one to come from his planet. Well, you know, did those people lie? <laughs> or was... <laughs> <laughs> was he not? Because I didn't think it was anybody who told him that. Right. I thought it was the narrator that told us all that. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so then that changes. You're like, wait a minute. You know, and I don't mind any of that, you know, rebooting. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Rebooting Superman. But um, so I just wanted if they were going to include her in this new um, Krypton TV show. As far as I know, I haven't heard any news about Supergirl being even mentioned or even her family being in, in the mix. Um, in the one and only Supergirl movie with Helen Slater, way back when, um, she came from 
Candor City. And Candor City is basically what Krypton is taking place in. So this is before it becomes the bottle city of Candor, which is what Brainiac ultimately makes Candor into is this bottled city. So I'm not sure if that will come into play. I would definitely think that if they're cousins, they have to be somewhere in the mix, maybe right. down the road, you I'm, know. And not only that, especially since Supergirl is doing well. Yeah. And it was only two years old. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, golly, you can't, I mean, this isn't Smallville, you know what I'm saying? Thank God. This is, <laughs> you know, this is when you keep up with Marvel. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you guys got to start thinking, what if this happens, like Black Lightning? Yeah. Okay, when are you going to bring him in? You've got his TV show. Exactly. Doing well. You can't you can't afford to leave him like Luke Cage. Yeah. Luke Cage can establish the Netflix universe. Yeah. But DC needs all the help they can get. <laughs> no, I you totally know? agree because that's one of my frustrations is that the whole DC EU has nothing to really like except for like Wonder Woman. They have really nothing to kind of be happy about the way things have progressed. And there's nothing. I mean, they've been they 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 had um uh what with um TV shows. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Smallville was you know had a fan base. I liked Flash. I mean, I didn't really care for I, Arrow that much, but a lot of people did. You yeah. know, the Arrow was like, and they all are like that. Supergirl's left. But even she becomes Saturday afternoon, um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, mm-hmm. when Marvel is doing Sleepy Hollow. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Mar- Marvel, you know, characters look real gritty and realistic. Right. Whereas, you know, Supergirl is fighting, you know, some Japanese giant stuffed Godzilla. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the monster of the week. Yeah, I totally get that. So, but the, the difference here is that, you know, thanks to like uh, Greg Berlanti is like the one who is putting this all together. You know, like you said, Supergirl was brand new and luckily they brought her into that universe. So even though she's on a, a parallel Earth, at least she has a way of coming in and out of that universe, you know, to join with Flash or Arrow. So they have to do the exact same thing with Black Lightning. Right. I I also think um, I'm, I think Black Panther wasn't a phenomenon. I think Black Panther is a part of the needed diversity mm-hmm. that is is part of being a um, global box office hit. I mean, it's more it's bigger than black people. It is showing some to be in the world. I mean, the closest thing I see to what the world may really want is exhibited by um, uh, um, Tim Diesel and his reboot of um, For X. Did you see his last installment? Of which one? No, Triple X. No, I haven't seen Triple X. That last one that came out last year, Uh it actually came out last February okay. is a perfect example of, of integrating multicultural characters in there. Now, what they do with Fast and Furious is they spread the love. Right. Meaning, when they go somewhere, everybody isn't just background stupid people mm-hmm. like um, Indiana Jones. <laughs> These people, you know, he may date a girl there. You know, when Fast and Furious goes, he goes and says, everybody he's got friends in Cuba he's got friends in Dominican Republic he has friends in Mexico wherever he goes in London mm-hmm. Tokyo you know he makes he's got a friend there and he's not just using them where like you know 007 when he would go to places Britain had a base and they were actually outsmarting the whole government of that particular country right I don't think that I don't think that's multicultural Vin Diesel when he there, he lands, he's got friends that help him with the overall cause. Right. Unless, unless you're like, um, 
Jason Bourne, where you come into a country, nothing, and, you know, you got to fight the people that you're after, but if the authorities catch you, they're after you also. So you're not outsmarting anybody. And I, and I kind of like that one, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, and that's in, in the sense that if you're running from the local authorities, that means you got to respect that they can actually get you. Right. Whereas James Bond, he's so strong that if any local government even says anything, they can match the British um, Queen's uh, magic forces. Then they can just squash it out mm -hmm. anyway. You know, they're not even fearful of the local people. Right. They're like when James Bond did something, I, I, would, I would say it was Haiti. Those They make the cops look so incompetent. You know, there's been no threat. James runs through all of them. Whereas Jason Bourne, he don't want to get caught by the cops. Right. But if he does, they they can kill him. He can die, too, from the cops. So I don't know, but I, I just think, you know, um, um, a lot of those stories, they, they don't um, embody some of the new things that are um, to take movies to that next level. Right. They'll still be successful, no question. But I think there's another level of global success, mm -hmm. especially now, uh, because we really didn't need global success the way we need it now before, because we had theaters. Yeah. And every country didn't have a theatrical market. They had a little bit of a DVD um theater craze that may have lasted well for five years, but that was nothing. Now that we have high-speed internet everywhere, cell phones, now you have a movie that can be streamed. Mm -hmm. And now it can be streamed all over the world at the same time, and we can get reports on how this movie is doing. Right. That, that is a different system than, um, well, we have to sell in European countries because they have a theatrical um, market. And, you know, China does too. Mm -hmm. But now, everybody, Africa's on the grid. Australia, I mean, um, India's on the grid. Yep. Everything is on the grid now because even if they're not paying for it, there's some advertiser that wants to advertise to all those people that are watching it from you know, some part of Brazil has a movie theater. No, I, I agree. The The international market is now doing better than domestic runs. So you have to realize that if you're going to put a product out there on a global scale, you have to be more inclusive now more than ever. And I think, you know, with the success of the Black Panther movie, other franchises or other big properties is going to have to look at more diversity uh, and telling different stories that we don't normally get to see on the big screen. Um, I think one of my um, issues that I've always had is like, I'm, I'm fine with superheroes, but every once in a while, let me see someone who kind of looks like me or looks like you, or looks like my daughter, you know, someone that is not the typical person that we normally see is always white. So my thing mm -hmm. is that, sure, we got Wonder Woman, and we got Black Panther, we have Captain America, Captain America, Captain Marvel coming up. So, I mean, we are making some strides, but like when we talked about James Bond, and we talked about the different actors, there was a time in which you know, Idris Elba's name was thrown out there, how he okay. could be the next James Bond. And and I remember reading the quote from Michelle Rodriguez from Fast and the Furious saying, don't do that. You want to make um, James Bond black? No, make your own heroes and put them on the screen. But by that argument... And, and, I, agree, and hmm? no, I agree with that. But I also think, you know, um, he didn't have to be James Bond. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or if he did, they were trying to expand James Bond anyway with Daniel Craig by making James Bond a non-person, mm -hmm. but a 
entity, he is an entity, then he can easily be Idris Alba or an Indian actor mm -hmm. because there's a lot of Indians in England as well. Right. Not to mention London had a um, what you call it? Um, uh, 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 yeah, they, they had the British Indian Empire the, in India. Yeah, so that yeah. will be interesting to see an Indian actor play James Bond and how right, cause the mayor yeah. was Indian. Yeah, so that'll be really, really freaking interesting. You know, <laughs> I mean, I just think you know if you expand it to show and and how they've done, you expand it to show the um, secret service. Mm -hmm. as being a reflection and even growing. I mean, I think the Kingsman did an excellent job showing the the, 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 the growth that a Secret Service um, agency has to go through to grow with the times. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I think that's what I liked about um, with uh, the introduction of Pierce Bronson as James Bond M was now a woman. So Dame Judy Dench took over that role. And right off the bat, you know, she was like, none of this sexist behavior that you had in the past, that is gone. And I think that was kind of refreshing. And I've enjoyed her run as M until Skyfall. Um, but you can easily do that with multiple characters. Like even now we have Doctor Who who for the past 13 generations of that character, we're now getting a woman to play that role. And it's nothing that it's against what other actors have done. It's what she can bring to the role and reinvigorate a series that's been out there for over 50 years. So with James Bond, I don't see why you can't change the, the, the dynamic in that sense to make it for a, a new audience or at least keep it going because you're going to be recycling the exact same typical white actor you're going to be losing especially now a whole audience that's not going to care you know um, I also think that with Money Penny being um, maybe the black girl I yeah think when Daniel Craig started, yes, that was a look in a sense too because um, it didn't feel like tokenism, right? Because she was never a major character. Mm -hmm. Then they came out with the Money Penny comic book, mm. and that was pretty good. I got it, but it was only one issue, and I thought it was going to be more. Um, I have to go look and see if it is more. If it came out with more, but who Money published Penny was it? Third. I. Image, IDW, I'm not exactly sure. It sounds like that's something they would do, yeah. Oh, I did not and know the that. Guy just, one, of the, one of the stores told me it was a one-shot, and I was like, all right, cool. But uh, we have, I'm a black science fiction creator right. and an independent creator. It is damn near impossible to come up with a new superhero of... Um, on the on the without it was becoming um, a copy of one of the other characters, right? You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. if you come up with somebody that runs fast, everybody's gonna say, you know, that's Flash. You know what I'm right. saying? However, if, if you dig into either the DC universe or the Marvel universe on its own, you'll see that they copy themselves. You know, right? You'll see villains with the same power. You'll see this and that. So um, it's just that a lot of people in the regular public don't know how overlapping powers are. Mm -hmm. Because they, they've only seen Superman be the one that can fly, you know. Uh, they've only seen certain super, superheroes, and they're all just indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. But um, when you get into the comic books, especially with what they're doing with Wakanda and some of the other ones, mm -hmm. now you're going to start seeing heroes with power to overlap, and that may open up the floodgates for new characters. I actually want to see them create a character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, something that's just for the, the, just the first time we're seeing it is in the movie. 
Mm -hmm. I think that would be tremendous. And then go back to comic book. Okay. What are your thoughts about what Marvel did to change a lot of the characters? Like Thor is now a woman. Uh, Sam Wilson took over the role for Captain America. So what do you think about those kind of changes and that kind of push to be more diverse? Well, again, those are comic books, and comic books are not canon, or that's in the Star Wars terminology, Mm. because Star Wars is really big on, you know, the books not just being fun stories, but actual background stories and expanded stories. But um, in Marvel and DC, in the comic book world, there's like five Spider-Man stories. You know what I'm saying? We have multiple universes for Flash and and many of these other characters. Mm -hmm. So uh, having a female Thor may just be Thor's dream. You know what I'm saying? Right. It may not be. It may may not. It may not be the real thing. So fun. It's fine. You know what I'm saying? Now until they appear in the movie is when we really have to deal with it. And if even if they appear in the movie, they They've been flushed out. It didn't feel like, okay, we're just doing this for an audience. Right. And they really invested in Falcon being um, Captain America. They're really investing in Thor being a female. I don't know what her name is. Right. Miles Morales mm-hmm. really got his own run of comic books. I think when it would be hard is when you got a Latino Spider-Man just for one episode. Right. You know, now, make possibly um, um, in the movies, oh, that's incredible. You know, because this Spider-Man animated movie is going to have the um, Dominican right. Spider-Man in it. Which is coming out later this so That's uh, amazing. This, yeah, you I know? can't wait for that. And, and, that. and the other thing is, like, I've noticed being down here in Miami with so much of a Latino presence, it's hard to have a visual Latino character without the character being authentically culturated. Mm-hmm. Whereas, take for instance, Lost in Space. Yeah, you I can gonna... have a black girl that has no cultural behavior. Mm-hmm. And still say we have a black girl. But in a comic book, your Latino um, character look white, may look light skinned black, mm-hmm. may even look dark skinned black, right? If it was up to Mela Negra, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Um, but we wouldn't read them as being Latino if they were named um, Noah or right. Hannah. They would have to have a Latino name, more than likely Spanish, Mm -hmm. and they would have to behave in some aspect of the culture. They would have to be familiar with the culture, either food or dance or something, or at least wear the flag, you know? And that is a different dynamic than what black um, characters are getting pressured, you know, because when, when they make rural black She's just black by color. She ain't got no other behavior. She she doesn't have, you know, a Jamaican flag. She don't have red, black, and green. Mm-hmm. She may not eat the food. If she was a Latino, she would have a Latino sounding name or she would do something because other than that, it would be indistinguishable from a white person. Right. Yeah, I my thing is that being Latin and Puerto Rican you know, when I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons and you had the challenge of the Super Friends and they made this kind of change, which you had um, Super Samurai, who's Japanese, and you had um, Cyborg, who's black, and you also had El Dorado, who's Mexican. <laughs> Other than El Dorado, who is named after the furniture <laughs> store, <laughs> what else is out there, other than Miles Morales, that I can say there's a Latin person, male or woman, that I like, it's on the big screen, or even in the comics. I mean, I think there is um, one of the young Avengers. It's the same thing with 
thing like when they do uh, Japanese or Chinese characters. Mm-hmm. It becomes, you know, Jade no Jade Face. Right. Jade Nice, you know, or when they used to <laughs> and that's why I didn't like um Luke Cage before. Yeah. Because he had the big collar shirt, he had the tiara. I love and that the big moment. <laughs> bracelets, you know, and it, and it was almost like he wasn't really Luke. He was Jive Man. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I read the early comics on those. So, And it was just like, oh, Jesus. Who was written by a white guy. And he, <laughs> and he sounded, he spoke Jive sweet yeah. Christmas. You know? Oh, he does that, but he was straight out of a spec, uh, an old shaft knockoff. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the whole thing. Okay. Like, I would like to see more of that happen uh, across the board. And to get to the, be the point where it doesn't become an issue that you don't need to be black, you don't need to be a woman, you don't need to be Latino or any other gender or ethnicity. You're just this great character, regardless, and okay. you can jump aboard. So that so that brings me to um, my pet peeve from today. Okay. Um, I don't know how it happens. Since I've been getting older... I've been a magnet for a variety of stressful things. And my stressful thing for today mm-hmm. was um, there was an article, and I, I just, you know, it took me a while to find out, to try to find out where my stress was coming from. So there was this article um, a little while ago about, um, uh, uh, about some black children. Mm-hmm. A study that was on black children, a poll, it was, I mean, it was a full study of black kids, and they said that black kids don't want to read about slavery. And it reminded me of what Snoop Dogg had said a couple of years ago. We don't want no more slave films, no slave, no slave movies, you know? And I was like, yeah, Snoop, I'm with you, you know? And I remember when I first started writing, um, I I would read, I had to read sci-fi, black sci-fi, diversity sci-fi, you know, black and white, you know, mm-hmm. it's mostly what I was reading. And I was finding that, you know, slavery was a real crutch scene. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I was like, uh, one, you know, one story was, um, there was a family defending their planet in space. And for some way, they got caught in a black hole or a loop in space, mm-hmm. and they ended up in Earth orbit, and they crashed on Earth. Now, they're a black family. Guess when they crashed on Earth? In America, in the 1700s. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's not like slavery was worldwide. Not like slavery, American slavery, was all from the beginning of time. So I was like, man, it felt like black. Um, remember the movie Brother from Another Planet? Yeah. And that was a sad story for me because it gave me no hope. It wasn't until I saw Lando Calrissian Mm-hmm. And I say, well, damn, at least we can be free in a, in space because Brother from Another Planet was run right here from slavery. Right. I was like, the hell is that fun? So um, I had posted a comment that what we're going to see in with multicultural interpreters of space stories is that they're going to be more than just Avatar with James Cameron. Mm -hmm. Avatar was a Pocahontas revenge story. And that's beautiful because that's the story of black and Latin. Europeans came to our islands and our continent and brought with them weaponry and they tried to steal our resources. And in fact, they did. So Pocahontas um, or Avatar, yo, they, we, you know what I'm saying? So that's a fantasy uh, analogy. But you know what's one step beyond that is actual black and Latino people expressing what they think of space and life in space. Meaning white people 
who came from Europe, they explored with, with Magellan, or America's Vespucci, or Hudson, or Christopher Columbus, out of need, and and you know Henry Hudson was trying to find play way to eat. He was looking for food. Them people were starving mm-hmm. in Holland when he left. So they were looking for food and resources. So they juxtaposed, and, and we know what Christopher Columbus was looking for. Mm-hmm. So they juxtaposed their cultures, explorers on aliens invaded. So when we get our alien invader movies, we get Independence Day. They want to come and just shoot us for no reason at all. We don't even know why they're shooting us. War of the Worlds where they're eating us. Right. We get a blip where they're drinking or draining our water from us. <laughs> you know, the, all, you name it. All of these stories of our European interpretations where we get one group of aliens Spock, you know, the Vulcans, right. amidst all of that that come down here who want to do something else. But it's my um, findings that black and Latino um, people who explored the world. It's not like, you know, Africans and Native Americans didn't go to other continents. You know, Europeans point the first ones to cross the Atlantic. But when we did, we didn't there as Columbus. We were coming out hungry like Henry Hudson, mm-hmm. looking for resources. We could feed ourselves just fine in Puerto Rico. We could feed ourselves just fine in Africa, Brazil, wherever we live. Even the Native in America, we were able to eat. So I don't see us writing aliens that would come to Earth to steal our resources, to kill our people, you know, just coming there like Predator. Predator is nothing but Tasmania, you know? That's what the Tasmanian um, hunters used to do. They used to go to southern Australia and they shoot people. That's what the Predator comes from, you know, Mm. or some bio-virus like the alien. But it all stems from aspects of their culture. So when we, when when I seen um, uh, multicultural people write space stories, sometimes they follow those same tropes because we just can't shake it from our head. We don't know how to write a story with um, drama. If it, You know, like that's become the drama that we've learned. But as I look further, we have different interpretations. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, is not just the diversity of characters is the diversity of story. And that's what I'm looking forward to. And that, you know, even with me, that's what I like. And that's why I try to, you know, imagine things that are different. And that's, to me, the element of of, um, of sci-fi that is untapped and, and is not the same old storyline. It's the future of sci-fi. Right. Those diverse, those diverse stories. Because I remember reading briefly, like, Octavia Butler, The Kindred. You know, uh, it's a time-traveling story where a woman is coming from the present and winding up in the past and during the slave times. I'm like, wow. I mean, it's an interesting concept, but it was like, it would be nice that you can look at doing a different story that is not tied to things that we've kind of grown up with and just be more... I mean, I've always loved enjoying reading science fiction. Let me tell you, my first sci-fi book mm-hmm. was a response to my frustration with Kendrick mm. and Wild Seed. Um, I, um, because Kendrick, the time travel, went back to, to slavery. Right. You know, um, Wild Seed was the story of some superheroes or people with superhero, superhuman powers. One person was like that he was Denzel Washington, which was a spirit that could jump from person to person. Yes, I remember and that. Then another, and another character in Wild Sea, this is both Octavia Butler books, was able to give birth children with extremely powerful attributes. However, they 
both got traded into slavery. One, the spirit jumper didn't care because he was able to jump in any spirit, so he wasn't trapped as a slave. He was a white person. He was a white person sometimes. He was this and that. Um, but I wrote my book, Thug Angel, Rebirth of a Gargoyle. It was also an immortal, right? And he was had almost like what's considered a Wakanda agreement with his um, powers. He he's a he's a um, a gargoyle who fights and protects human souls from immortal predators. He's immortal, but he fights to protect um, human spirits from vampires, werewolves, and other demons. But in order to maintain his more immortality, he can't involve himself in human human conflict. So as he lived through slavery, the fall of Egypt to the Arab nation, he could not get involved directly. However, he did do other things. Like he opened up a school to teach kids um, how to learn their history. He was, he was a revolutionary of sorts, you know, throughout his time. Um, so it was different. And I just felt like I could not write a story where a character um, lived through these times all of a certain ethnicity and did not do anything. I just couldn't understand that, you know. And it's, it's part of the problem that a lot of people are having with Wakanda. You know, people that are not comic books that are coming straight from the hood are saying, yo, Black Panther, Wakanda's a sellout. You know what I'm saying? Mm. You're almost wondering, what what did Wakanda do during slavery? You know, we had famines in Africa, starving people, and Wakanda didn't do anything. So Wakanda, as great as it is, has a huge explanation yeah. to give to, to people, you know? Um... And that's yeah. So that that becomes a little bit of a of a of a uh, opportunity to write your way out of that hole. Right, and I think that's what makes Killmonger's point about no, no, no. We have the resources. Let's do something about this right now. You know, and yeah. the whole turning your back towards the rest of the world that has to stop. So you're almost like yeah. I get his point a hundred percent because. They had the opportunity to save everyone else from being slaves, but they closed themselves off. So, uh, again, it, that's a, what I think what makes Killmonger more interesting is that he has a point of view that you can almost agree with 100%. I think, you know, Braveheart went through the Killmonger. Yeah. It's more than just you know, black people, This is he's dealing with the black people's situation, but he's speaking a universal reaction, mm -hmm. you know, and um, when you take it away from the black and uh, African experience, African world experience, it definitely um, are similarities in things that other people can relate to. So, yeah, um, and again, I think that was not always Killmonger's simple explanation for his actions. I think in the comic books, and I'm not, you know, you can correct me, he wasn't always that accurate with why he was hating on Black Panther. And I think they made him really good in the movie, mm -hmm. um, a lot better than he was even in the comic book. Right. Especially with of um, how they reworked his um, image and how he looked, you know. I like those bumps on his body and right. how he got him the scars. Right. L you let know? me ask this question um, to you. I yeah. had a couple of people that I've worked with um, who had watched Black Lightning or Black Panther, and they felt, because it was so Afro Afrocentric, that they really almost couldn't get into it. And I, when I heard this, I was just like, but now you know what it feels like for someone who's black to be watching all these white superheroes. 
It's kind yeah. of white centric. So it's kind of weird that, yeah. you know, it has this impact that makes people feel like, well, I'm not sure if I can relate to that. But I got it. I think, I, I, I mean, and I don't, I mean, I understand what there's, but I don't understand what they mean in the sense that um, Luke Cage was a certain element and maybe they felt the same way about Luke Cage, but what is Afrocentric? You, because to me, it's just substitution of variables. If you're African or black, you like Africa. Mm -hmm. If you are white, then you like your particular country, Italian, Spanish, French, English, Dutch, Russian, German, you name it. And we've seen that. So what is the difficulty in a person having a respect for a continent that they can't identify which individual individual country they come from? You know, because if that's the case, then what are they going to do when a Latino person is on there? Mm -hmm. Because they are more heavily culturated than anybody else because their culture has to define them. It's evident in their language. It's just as important as an Asian person. So what are they saying? They, and, and I always said, I love kung fu movies. Mm -hmm. But I didn't expect for them to have anything but Asian culture in it. Right. I wanted one of my Asians in Kung Fu movies to act like Asians. I didn't want them to, you know, not eat rice with chopsticks. I didn't want them to, you know, go to the to the, the to the um diner and pick up a big Mac. That wouldn't make sense. Right. And you it, know, it's weird. Um, go ahead. No, so yeah, I, I that is my challenge, you know, with 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 um people that have a problem with say black lightning because I don't see him doing anything overly black. He it reminds me of the principal um in the wire. Do you remember the wire? I have not seen the series. I, I know of it but I have not seen it. Okay. In the series you had a black community that was plagued by crack and a police force that was mostly white but very diverse. You had black people over the series move up the ranks to damn near chief. You had a black mayor with uh, other white politicians, very much like how Baltimore really is. Mm -hmm. And um, over time, the you know one of the uh, the politicians he didn't win his election or his second election. He ended up um, becoming the principal of a school, and he. Um, had a, a, a awakening of being a crooked politician. And so when he became a principal, he wanted to make up for a lot of those problems because he connected with one of the kids whose parents were, were locked up and they were on the path to becoming a drug dealer. And he pulled the kid off the street and then he went to work with him in the school. And it reminded me very much like what the principal is doing in Black Lightning. Mm -hmm. The only difference is, I think, in Black Lightning, his daughters are a big factor, whereas in The Wire, he didn't have any children. That's why he took in the child. But it's still some of similar obstacles because you have somebody that you love and you're looking out for uh, amongst a, a, a gang drug community. And so at some point, you got to deal with the community if you even want to help your children. And that's the dilemma that black thing is in. And is that Afrocentric to think of it like that? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. And I always, you know, like, um, take for instance, lost in space, just to give real, uh, um, current example. One of the problems I always had with these white stories is how they only identify their family as just the father, mother, and children. They don't have grandparents sometimes. They don't have uncles and aunts. Their parents don't have no brothers and sisters. 
my God, you know what I'm saying? Right. I, I was, I was, um, I was watching, um, uh, uh, Black Light. I mean, um, uh, uh, Lost in Space, and I was like, you know, they're happy with just making sure her son gets on the ship. She don't have nobody else she cares about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's your opinion. Yeah. I, you know, I'm from a, I'm from an integrated town. We had, my cousins came over, every family member in my room, my father grew up with, came to our house. We went to visit their houses. You right. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, we had family reunion. Is that Afrocentric? Maybe it is. But the Brady one, she never met any of their cousins. Oh, except for Cousin Oliver. And everything went downhill from yeah. there. <laughs> Yes, it was almost like a spectacle. You know what I'm saying? It right. It was almost like a spectacle. You know, but in in, in the Cosby show, the grandparents was part of the family. Right. You know, um, good times, you met uncle such and such. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's different. With, we're, we're not exactly the same. Yeah. And so, I don't think... Has to because when they say it's like it's Afrocentric, it's like it's trying to be preachy, and it's really not trying to be preachy. It's just a black family, right? And showing you how how black families exist. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, when they have when Black Beetle gets his show, right? Is he not supposed to, you know, have a lot of family members and co and family connections, right? You know, I and. Agree. It, is he not supposed to care about him? Shoot, when you go on to save the city, you're saving a bunch of strangers like Captain America who's coming from a different time period. But even with Captain America, shoot, I'd be like, yo, how did the, my, my cousins turn out? How did their children turn out? Mm -hmm. I gotta have somebody that I'm still related to. Come on. Right. On that note, um, I'm not sure if you know of yeah. an anime TV show called um, Star Blazers. It came Which out one is it? Star Blazers. It was uh, called a, a Starship Yamato. Um, and basically, uh -huh. um, long story short, is that they made it a live action movie of that anime uh, that came on TV from the 70s. So when I okay, looked, okay. so when I looked at this, it's all Asian actors. And, you know, for the most part, I enjoyed this. So there was a big space battle in which the, the this one ship called Yamato goes out into space and to defend Earth. And I was thinking, it's like, it's interesting how, how they haven't had any, like, American actors on this movie. And then it dawned on me, it's like, no, they get to be the heroes of their story. They're the ones protecting right. Earth for us. So why is right. it that it's hard for us to be on board with them? If they're protecting you, you don't give a crap about who they are. As long as you're safe right. and they can do this, go ahead. But that's when it kind of clicked on me. It's like, it makes no difference. If they're the heroes, you understand what a hero has to do. And that's like a universal basic truth. So regardless of if it's a woman, if it's a man, if he's black, he's brown, does it make a difference? It doesn't. So I'm hoping that, you know, this kind of conversation for the next generation and so forth, you know, keeps pushing that to become a non issue. We'll see. I agree. That is that I mean people always ask, you know, what is the different expressions of space? I was like Yo, Godzilla had space villains. Monster Zero from out of space. And he was controlled by other Asian people from out of space. Right. Those people weren't. They weren't from Earth. Yeah. And that's that's a space interpretation. And they were perfectly... I think Gamera was even further into the space, the Asian space universe. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I think, you know, as I... So I talk to my, my wife, she's Dominican, that you know, we can explore a Latino um, space story. You, it would be hard to um, ground it in Spanish. 
mm-hmm. because that's a conqueror's that's a conqueror's language. Now, if you, if you did Spanish, you wouldn't be able to ground it in too much Spanish culture or um, Spanish interpreted, you know, Puerto Rican or Dominican. You would have to go even deeper. And when you went deeper, you would go into some of the Indians who on those islands and discovering some deeper roots, deeper than even Spanish people like to go, especially in America. You don't really hear them saying, oh, I'm Mayan, I'm a Incan, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But they're, they're mixed with that, even if they got, you know, for the most part, blended with Mexican and European blood, there's still an element that is uh, of the Inca and Mayan element. So if you were to do a space story, it would be all right to have the Inca and Mayan elements out there in space. And I think that's beautiful because, mm-hmm. it, you know, those those cultures always were rumored to have some terrestrial connection. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, South, like South Africa. And that even better did to outer space right. than, you know, Europeans who don't have any Space connection, you know, to it. Whether you say Greek gods, you know, Orion, and all of those, then those reflections of what's here on Earth. It's never been really said that those terrestrial references were what Greek gods were reflected from. So it was nothing terrestrial. You got that Mayan calendar. That that's a uh, terrestrial. You know, element. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a good look. I don't know, but again, maybe we'll see that. Right. Maybe we'll see that in in, in times to come. I just think it's it's really fresh. Um, the closest I've done, I have a story called "Welcome to Boss Lady's Planet." Yes. And you know how I wrote that? It was inspired by Serenity, <laughs> uh, the movie, where um, I just took that Earth populated a variety of planets by terraforming them or just finding out um, that they were life sustaining, uh, very much like the expanse. And I just said, you know, each of Earth's continents got their own planet. And they just right. kept it moving like that as opposed because I didn't want to just say, oh, it's black people in the all multi planeted black planeted system. Mm-hmm. So I said, I said, you know what, let me be fair. Now, since Black Panther, I'm like, you know what, let me appeal the all-black space type story. Even though the story that I wrote, um, it's all mostly black and Latino characters. The universe is um, as diverse as humans Earth. Um, those humans are. It's just that I don't have any Indian characters. I don't have any other characters except for black and Latino characters. I don't have any white characters. There are white people in the universe. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. Uh, when I posted that uh, thing on Facebook about the, the Titans, and you kind of were like really upset about the the costume for Starfire. Yes. Give me your reasons why you were um, upset. <laughs> sheesh, I just, um, somebody just said, um, well, I was listening to the breakfast group up this morning, and the congresswoman was teasing DJ Envy and said, you know, Black Panther is a product of a Howard, Uni- Howard University graduate. And DJ Envy went to Hampton. So they always say, HU is not Hampton, it's Howard. Real HU is Hampton and that. And so they were bantering. So Envy said, uh, but the costumes of Wakanda were from a Hampton alumni. And when you talk about this character, um, Starfire, having a full body suit in the cartoon and having some ghetto, fabulous outfit. <laughs> With, with bad weave or bad wig in the cartoon, I mean, in the live act, 
it's like, oh my God, we're going back in time. We're taking a step back. Yeah. So especially when when we see what the curvaceous black girl in Black Lightning can look in a bodysuit. Mm-hmm. I mean, man, she was the baddest chick yeah. of all the superheroes. I'm like, she, she, she looks so good in her bodysuit that they had to write it into the storyline. Right. <laughs> Sister said, your booty has gone viral. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the potential of Starfire in the DC universe could have been ridiculous. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Amazing. Um, and without it being sexist, because in the cartoons, they draw unrealistically developed, exaggerated women. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And in in a unless you're getting an Anna Nicole Smith, you know what I'm saying, is just using a realistic person. Right. So why not embrace the curves that we see now VH one and M T V. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? You know, I would say when I saw Flavor of Love is when I saw all <laughs> these curvaceous women of color. Right. You know what I'm saying? It was, you know, I saw Latino and black women, hell we even white girls with, with booties and curves on on Flavor of Love. And ever since then, if you look now on MTV, they have a show called Island of the X's or mm-hmm. X to the Beach or something like that. All them women are curvaceous. They got a Latino girl on there from Bad Girls Club. They got some, another black girl. But we still don't see these. We see the... um. Uh, Eva Lingori, who's still just a pretty face. Mm-hmm. Michelle Rodriguez, who's got a dyke body. Nothing wrong with it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, who's the other one? Um, Zoe Zaldana, who yeah. has no, no body. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and then you, then you have Viva, what's the, what's the one in, um, uh, the one has the Sophia Viagra? Yeah, she all very is, uh, curvy. Yeah, she's, yeah, she has a body, but she's cartooned it. She, she went the um, Charo route. You know what I'm saying? Very so much so. So her body yep. became, it became an amusement instead of allowing her to portray a real with curves. Mm-hmm. So where, where are we going to have that? You know what I'm saying? Where, where are we going to have it? I mean, you can look at Wonder Woman. One of the things that laughed about when she was in... Um, um, Jonathan Prius was that she didn't have no body. Mm-hmm. So they was like, oh, how is she going to be able to play uh, 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 a Wonder Woman, you know? Especially coming from Linda Carter, who was a sexy woman. Right. So I don't know. I just think um, it was a big, stupid thing. I don't think um, there's anything wrong with um, putting a woman like the girl in the white, white men, the pizza, or whatever her name is, in a movie. Mm-hmm. I don't think it makes it a rated R movie. I think you can have, I mean, these are women in real life, so kids have teachers with booties, you know, what's wrong with them seeing a woman in spandex? Right. In, in a movie, it doesn't make it rated R. Maybe, you know, old white men, that's what they're thinking in their mind, <laughs> but it doesn't mean... <laughs> you know, shoot. So I, I mean, we see breasts everywhere. Yeah, I, I think I don't know. Yeah, my thing is like when I saw the costume, and I was just like, really, we're doing kind of like the Smallville. Let's just do the color scheme of a costume and not do anything else to this. So sure, she has a purple outfit and that kind of really bad hair, but and then I thought about, well, maybe she's just going out. And, you know, in regular street clothes. And I'm hoping that's what that is. You know, that they're just out and she doesn't have to wear a uniform. But on that token, you know, when I look at the X-Men movie, everyone's all wearing black. And and Hugh uh, playing Wolverine says, you know, what do you expect, you know, to wear yellow spandex and that kind of outfit? And like, it doesn't work in real life. Right. But, uh, you know, give us some kind of color that I'm hoping that this is just a really bad image and taken out of context. 
So if that's the case, I don't know. Yeah, we'll see because it, it's still being filmed. <laughs> right. I'm hoping like I'm hoping like what you're saying is the first Spider-Man costume that she is a, a extraterrestrial alien that comes to Earth that doesn't know fashion. Right. right away. Exactly. And she learns fashion later on. So right. maybe that's the joke suit. Right. And they say, oh no, you can't wear that. But my thing. Where do you get the hair from? Because <laughs> it wasn't just, it wasn't just the, you know, I mean, we've seen people with better colored hair than that. Yeah. Oh my God, she looks like she's wearing a bad wig. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately. She looks like Holly Berry from Baps. Oh and God. It, and it's, it's, <laughs> but that's what she looks like. She got the no, I agree. Jewelry, the overly hyper colored outfit. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a, it looks bad. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Especially coming off of Suicide Squad, where that wasn't no damn good. Uh. All right, so Jeff, um, where can we find your book? Just to give a nice little plug for you. Well, you can go to Amazon. That's my main hub. Mm-hmm. I have three books that are with other publishers, and I have well, actually four, and I have three that are. Un- my own publishing. Um, so you can find all of them on Amazon. My books are only, my self-published books are only on my, um, only on Amazon because I only did Create Space. I didn't do Look um, or iBook. Okay. Um, but, so they're all on Amazon. You go to Jeff Carroll, um, Google any of my titles, Harlem Shake, The Shoot of the Zombie Killer, Welcome on the Boss Planet, Thug Angel, Rebirth of a Gargoyle, Sci-Fi Streets, It Happened on Negro Mountain, or um, Go Dig a Killer, and you'll see all of my books. But it's really been a pleasure. Please, when you post this, yes. tag me, because oh, definitely. we you'll... said some really amazing things in here, and I want to share it to other people. Oh, please. I, I, you know, I want to get you back, because um, we've met, you know, I think about a year or two almost from the night we met in Boca uh, for the Nerd yes. Night. So, like, I still want to get you down to where I work down in Cutler Bay um, and for our U Media Center to talk to the teens about what you do. Because, again, what you talked about that night, that's like, I got to talk to that guy and have him talk to my teens down here. So, hopefully, we can get our schedule synced up that you can come down further because. Exactly what you're talking about. I would love for that kind of conversation to happen down there because I have a bunch of kids yes, that would love to talk about this. We, we didn't talk Pacific Rim. We didn't talk Rampage. And we got to talk Infinity Wars and Han Solo's movie. So mm-hmm. we got to get back together. Oh, definitely we will. We will. So it's been a pleasure, right. Jeff. All right. So that basically ends our podcast for today. So. It's a much longer podcast than usual, but that's okay, because this is what I love to do. And I'm glad this all came out the way it did. So you got to have Sci-Fi News Plus this week. I want to thank Jeff for really having a great conversation with me. Um, I, I can't thank him enough for that. Even though he has mentioned where you can find his books, which is on Amazon, I will have a link in my show notes, so if you want... Go ahead and buy his books online through Amazon. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to see Avengers this weekend. I advise you to email me if you want to have your thoughts, your views, your opinions, your comments to be shared on my podcast. I want you to do that. So, email me at show at gmail.com. You can follow me on the various social networks. So again, thank you for listening to me and to Jeff on the Monster Sci-Fi Show podcast. It's sci-fi from a certain point of view. Good night.
This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.